Hello, my name is Andrew Coogan. I am a pharmacist within the Office of Generic Drug Policy at FDA. I'm a member of the Patent and Exclusivity Team, and today I will be presenting on best practices for 505B2 and ANDA applicants. Uh, this session is designed to discuss best practices for 505B2 and ANDA applicants um, as it relates to addressing patent information listed in Orange Book, as well as how to respond when changes to patent information happens. So the learning objectives for today's presentation. I will explain the types of patent certifications. I will discuss how and when to respond to changes to patent information. I will review other best practices for ANDA applicants. I'll apply what was discussed in a case study and then finally bring it all together with challenge questions. So. Since I work in the Office of Generic Drug Policy, uh, my presentation will at some points focus on ANDA applicants, and other times we'll be applying to both 505B2 and applicants. In the next presentation, uh, Marianne Holovac from the Office of New Drug Policy will focus in more of her presentation on things related specifically to 505B2. So in this presentation, the majority of it will apply to both 505B2 and ANDA applicants. If there's anything that applies only to ANDAs, I will uh, note that in the, in the slides. But for the most part, this is information that applies to both 505B2s and ANDA applicants. So patent certifications. All applicants, both 505B2 and ANDA applicants, are required to certify with respect to each patent listed for the restaurant listed drug in Orange Book. So for 505B2s and ANDA applicants, there's different parts of the regulations where this requirement is listed. However, um, for both 505B2s and ANDA applicants, there are, are two major buckets of um, how to certify the patents. The first is if there are no patents listed or they have expired, and the second is when there are unexpired patents. So if there are no patents listed or the patents have expired, there's one of three options for 505B2 and ANDA applicants to address the patent information. They can submit a paragraph one certification stating that patent information has not been filed. They can submit a paragraph two certification saying that the patents have expired, or they can submit a no relevant patent statement. If there are unexpired patents listed in the orange book, then one of the following options an applicant can uh, submit. So. They can submit a paragraph three certification, meaning that they're gonna wait for the date on which the patent will expire before uh, seeking final approval of their application. They can submit a paragraph four certification stating that the patent is invalid, unenforceable, or will not be infringed by the manufacturer use or sale of the drug product for which the application is submitted. They can use a method of use patent statement if um, the patent in question has a method of use, uh, they can submit a, a statement that they are not seeking that method of use uh, that is protected by patent information. For ANDAs, this is also referred to as a Section 8 statement. And if there is more than one method of use uh, patent, or it's a, a information that has drug substance, drug product, and a use code, then an applicant can elect to provide paragraph four certification to some parts of the patent and a method of use statement to other parts. And this is sometimes referred to as a split certification. So in the next presentation, Marianne Holovac will provide some examples related to method of use patents and split certifications. And for now, I will focus on uh, paragraph four certifications that apply to both ANDA applicants and 505B2 applicants, um, mostly focusing on sending certification. So notice a paragraph four certification. For 505B2 applicants and ANDA applicants, they're required to uh, not only submit paragraph four certification information to the agency, but also to uh, the NDA holder as well as uh, the patent owners. So for 505B2s and ANDA applicants, the associated uh, regulations for um, sending notice are, are listed here. And for the most part, the information is, is the same in, in both uh, 314.52 and 314.95. Um, 
Today I will be focusing in on uh, sending the notice, the documentation of timely sending, as well as the 45-day period. So sending the notice. Applicants, both 505B2 and ANDAs, must provide notice of paragraph 4 certification to the RLD holder and patent owners within 20 days after the date of postmark on the paragraph 4 acknowledgement letter. For ANDA applicants, this is particularly important with regards to um, 180 exclusivity that you make sure that you get your uh, paragraph 4 certification notice sent within 20 days of the, the filing letter. Um, after you send notice, you must also provide documentation of timely sending and receipt of notice to the agency. So for 505B2s, 31452E outlines the requirements, and for ANDAs, it's 31495E. But the documentation must be submitted to the agency showing that not only did you send the notice, but that it was received by the appropriate parties. After sending notice, uh, there's a 45-day period in which the NDA holder patent owners can sue the uh, ANDA applicant or 505B2 applicant that would trigger a stay of approval. Um, and so that is a period that runs from the receipt of notification and we go based on the date of what the uh, applicant has provided when they provide documentation of timely sending and receipt of notice. So some common issues with sending notice and this applies to both ANDA applicants and 505B2s. Uh, notice documentation could be missing or not provided to the agency, either that you sent notice and never notified us by providing documentation, um, or that you provided uh, paragraph 4 certification but never um, submitted that to the agency. Um, notice documents don't align or incomplete. Was notice appropriately provided? Licensure agreement provided but notice documents are missing. This can happen sometimes where an AND applicant or a 505B2 applicant gets a licensure agreement for a patent, which is nice information for the agency to have. However, you're still required to send the notice and provide documentation of sending the notice. Um, and the last issue is uh, notifying FDA if litigation is filed within the 45-day period after receipt of notice. Applicants are also to notify the agency if the 45-day expires and they were not um, sued on their paragraph four certifications. So changes in patent information. So sometimes what can happen after an ANDA applicant or a 505B2 applicant is uh, received their paragraph four acknowledgement letter, that patent information listed in the Orange Book can change. So there can either be newly listed patents, uh, new use codes listed with previously listed patents, or some of the use codes can be revised. And so these are situations that require action on 505B2 applicants and ANDA applicants part. So newly listed patents. An applicant must address all new timely filed patents listed in the Orange Book after its application has been filed with one of the previously discussed patent certifications. Application must also comply with regulations, sending notice, documentation, and delivery of notice. However, there is no stay associated with patents listed after an applicant has been acknowledged for filing. So ANDA applicants, as well as 505B2 applicants, must address all patents, um, even if they've been submitted after the application has been acknowledged for filing. And the key word here is timely filed patents, which makes you think, well, what does that mean? What is a timely filed patent? Well, timely versus untimely filed patents. A patent is deemed untimely filed if the patent is submitted for listing more than 30 days after the NDA is approved, so the RLD upon which the ANDA applicant or the 505B2 applicant is relying, the patent has been issued by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, or the approval of a supplement that allows for the listing of the patent. So if a RLD submits patent information that is more than 30 days after one of these events, then it is deemed untimely filed. Applicants who have been acknowledged for filing are not required to certify to untimely filed patent information. If an applicant provides a patent certification to a patent that they um, ultimately determine to be untimely filed, they can withdraw that certification. So similar to new patents, the RLD can also get new use codes listed in the orange book for previously submitted patents. And 
and similar again to new patents, if the new use code is timely filed, applicants must address it. So let's say an RLD is approved for a supplement that uh, is for a, a new indication and they have a use code that they would like listed associated with a patent related to that indication. If they submit it to the agency within 30 days of approval of that supplement, the new use code is considered timely filed. If it's outside that 30 days, it will be considered untimely filed. RLDs can also revise use codes that are listed in the Orange Book. So applicants must update their patent certification if the revised use code is timely filed and the applicant has previously addressed that patent and its use code with a paragraph four certification, a method of use statement, or some sort of split certification. It should be noted that use codes that are the basis for 108 exclusivity for ANDA applicants cannot be dislisted, sorry, delisted until after 180 days has either been forfeited or expired. So if a ANDA applicant submits paragraph four certification to a patent and it has one use code and that use code is revised by the NDA holder, the use code that was listed at the time that the ANDA was filed and is the basis for the ANDA's 180 exclusivity will not be removed from Orange Book until after 180 days has either been forfeited or expired. And similar to new patents, uh, applicants are required to send notice of paragraph four certification for both newly listed and revised use codes. And the appropriate regulations can be found at 314.52 for 505b2 applications and 314.95 for and applications. So now that we've talked a little bit about revised use codes, I think it's helpful to see a real world example of what this might look like for a uh, and application. So in this case study, we will be looking at the RLD uh, Galinia Fingolamide 0.5 milligram capsules and the NDA number is 22527. So there are multiple patents listed for this drug product. However, we'll be focusing today on patent number 405, which was added to Orange Book on December 2nd, 2015, and has one patent use code associated with it, U1086, treatment of autoimmune disease. So in this example, we'll look at a hypothetical ANDA, ANDA X, which let's say it's submitted on January 1st, 2018, and elects to provide a paragraph four certification to patent 405 and the associated use code 1086. In this example, let's say ANDA X is sued on this P4 certification. On August 16th, 2019, a supplement is approved for the RLD Supplement 29. Within 30 days of supplement approval, the RLD submits a Form 3542, meaning that they have submitted a timely filed information. And this FDA 3542 form is to revise the use code that's currently listed for the 405 patent U1086 to U2613, treatment of relapsing remitting sclerosis MS. So the use codes being revised from treatment of autoimmune disease to treatment of relapsing remitting sclerosis based on the supplement that was approved on August 16th. In this example, and X sees that the RLD has updated their labeling and on December 1st, 2019, decides to update their labeling as well and provide a labeling amendment that seeks to add a new use, or sorry, a new indication or other condition of use. Since the RLD in this example has revised their use code, so it's been revised from use code 1086 to use code U2613, and X original paragraph four certification to the 405 patent is no longer valid. In this situation, the applicant for ANDA X may maintain their paragraph four certification if they wish. However, they need to recertify, re-notify as outlined in 21 CFR 314.96 D1, since their labeling amendment seeks to add a new indication or other condition of use. So this is an example of a situation where the RLD has revised their use code. It's been updated in Orange Book, and now the ANDA applicant, if they wish to maintain their paragraph four certification, must address it by recertifying, re-notifying. So now that we've talked about some of the ways that applicants can 
address patent information list in the Orange Book. We'll discuss some other best practices for ANDA applicants. So one thing I want to talk about today is uh, pediatric exclusivity. So patents listed in Orange Book for RLDs can sometimes get pediatric exclusivity, and sponsors of ANDA applicants may not maintain paragraph four certification to an expired patent. So if a patent has a pediatric exclusivity attached to it, and that patent expires, then an ANDA applicant is deemed to have a P2 certification to that patent as soon as it expires. So the pediatric exclusivity is now a blocking of approval. So an ANDA applicant can either wait until that pediatric exclusivity expires, or if they want to get approved sooner, they can get a pediatric exclusivity waiver from the NDA holder. Waivers should be on NDA letterheads and they should be signed by the NDA's responsible agent. Waivers should also have an effective date of the waiver. Some other best practices for ANDA applicants. Um, with regards to court documents, please notify FDA of entry of all final court orders and judgments. Um, this is outlined in 314.107E. Uh, so not just the um, judgments in favor of ANDA applicants, but any judgments against the applicant. Uh, if it's entered in a final decision or a judgment, then you need to submit that information to the agency. Also, another comment on court documents, when you provide paragraph four certification, if you are sued um, within that 45 day period to trigger a stay of approval, please notify us of that and provide a complete copy of the first civil action complaint along with the civil action number. Um, some other best practices for applicants with regards to first filers. Um, first filers are required to notify FDA within 30 days of marketing um, and the associated regulation is 314.107C2 and this includes marketing of an authorized generic. So if you're a first filer applicant and you authorize, or sorry, you market an authorized generic you are required to submit notification within 30 days of that marketing. So if you are, you know, even if you're tentatively approved or still under review, if you launch an authorized generic, that is a marketing event that is required to be notified of the agency. So now that we've gone over all this information, uh, we'll do a couple of uh, challenge questions just to kind of uh, review what we've learned. So first challenge question. Which of the following can be addressed with a Section 8 statement? A drug product patent, a drug substance patent, a method of use of patent, or none of the above? And the answer here is a method of use patent. Section 8 statements, as I said before, are a term that we use in the um, review of ANDA applications, and these are uh, similar to method of use statements. Challenge question number two. An ANDA applicant is a first filer and the basis of their 1A day exclusivity is patent 222, a method of use patent with use code U111. Which of the following statements is not true? The RLD can delist their use code and the first filer will lose their 1A day exclusivity seat. The and applicant can revise their paragraph four certification to a section eight statement and retain eligibility for 1A day exclusivity. Uh, if the RLD lists a new use code for patent 222, and the ANDA applicant submits a paragraph four certification, there will be a new stay of approval, or all of the above are not true. And with this example, all of the above are not true. As I said before, RLDs cannot delist use codes if 1A day exclusivity is tied to that use code, and they cannot be delisted until 1A day is either expired or been forfeited. And applicants who revise a paragraph four certification to a section eight statement, if that use code is the only use code associated with a patent and it's the basis for 180 day, then they would no longer be eligible for 180 day exclusivity because they fail to maintain a paragraph four certification. If the RLD lists a new use code for patent 222, um, there is no stay of approval if the applicant decides to address it with a paragraph four certification. So, in summary, all applicants, both 505B2 and applicants, must address all patents listed in the Orange Book for the RLD. 
if a new patent or use code is timely filed and listed in the Orange Book after an ANDA is submitted but before it's approved, and applicants must address it with an appropriate patent certification or statement. This is true for 505B2 applicants as well. There is no additional stay of approval for paragraph four certifications to newly listed patents or use codes. If you have any questions related to patents and exclusivities for ANDAs, this email address is for the CEDAR patent exclusivity team, and we will be able to answer those questions for you. And that is all I have. And next will be Marianne Holovac from Office of New Drug Policy to discuss more information on best practices for 505B2 applications. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marianne Holovac, and I am a 505B2 program coordinator in the Office of New Drug Policy within the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, FDA. Today, I would like to help you provide perfect patent certifications for your B2 applications. Today's learning objectives, we will describe what makes an application a B2. We will describe regulatory requirement differences between B1 and B2 NDAs, as well as ANDAs. And we will describe utilization of the Orange Book for B2 patent certifications. This table is a comparison of the three types of applications that are described under Section 505 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Our focus will be on the, the middle column for the B2 NDAs. And you will notice one difference between a B2 NDA and a B1 NDA is the patent certification requirement, if applicable, and that is if there is listed drug reliance. You will also note that a B2 application may contain comparative bio bioavailability data that is not part of a B1 NDA application. You will also note a couple differences between B2 NDAs and ANDAs, most notably the lack of preclinical, clinical, and pediatric use data in an ANDA. And you will note that, that an ANDA actually has bioequivalence data, which accounts for the, 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 not, the application not including the preclinical, clinical, and pediatric use information. So what exactly is a 505B2 application? Well, this is the official definition. So a 505B2 application, it's an application that contains full reports of investigations for safety and effectiveness, where at least some of the information relied upon for approval comes from studies not conducted by or for the applicant and for which the applicant has not obtained a right of reference from the person by or for whom the investigations were conducted. So what does that mean with respect to 505B2s? Well, the thing to keep in mind is the primary difference between a B1 and a B2 application is the source of the information relied upon for the B2 application is not owned by the applicant or the applicant does not have a right of reference. The approval standards for a B2 application are the same as the approval standards for a B1 application. Uh, as I noted uh, uh, in, in the uh, official uh, definition of a B2, some, the source of information is not owned by the applicant, so this provides for additional regulatory obligations for the B2 applicant, which include a patent certification and bridging as applicable. It's also uh, worth noting that B2 applications do not have the ANDA sameness requirements. So uh, what that means is that a B2 application may rely in part on another listed drug for some portions of their application, but they also may submit clinical studies making their proposed product actually very different from the relied upon listed drugs. So they may have a completely new dosage form or a completely new uh, indication or route of administration uh, not, uh, that's different from the relied upon listed drug. So uh, when you're preparing your patent certification for your B2 application, 
the primary tool that you need to consult with is the Orange Book uh, when you're considering your patent certifications. The Orange Book includes newly listed patents or changes to existing patent listings. So a uh, patent certification for a B2 application needs to be maintained while the B2 application is undergoing review. Uh, the B2 application may require an updated patent certification when certain Orange Book changes occur, such as a, a new, new patent listing or a change to the existing patent listing. Okay, uh, this sounds, uh, seems pretty uh, self-explanatory, but when you're preparing your, your patent certifications, uh, you need to be aware of which uh, approval pathway uh, your application is under, so you need to cite the correct regulation. Uh, we see this all the time uh, with B2 applications uh, submitting the, uh, the regulations, the, their patent certification, which includes the generic drug uh, regulations. So the B2 patent certifications are under 314.50I1I. Uh, compared to the ANDA uh, patent certification regulations, which are under 314.94A12. A 505B2 may rely upon multiple sources. A B2 application can rely, it, uh, can rely upon literature, and they also may rely upon multiple listed drugs. If more than one listed drug is relied upon, a patent certification is needed for each and every listed drug relied upon. A patent certification is required even if there are no patents listed in the Orange Book for the listed drug relied upon. And what we see often will be uh, an applicant may uh, provide a patent certification to one of their listed drugs for which there are unexpired patents but may neglect to provide a patent certification for maybe a second or third relied upon listed drug. Uh, oftentimes, those, the second and third drug will not have unexpired patents, and they neglect to still provide a patent certification to those drugs that are relied upon. So another thing that we consider uh, in our regulatory review of B2 applications is piggyback and reachback. An applicant may cross-reference a previously approved B2 application for which it's the NDA holder to support approval of a new B2 NDA. However, reach back patent certification to the original list of drug relied upon in the approved B2 application for which it's cross-referencing uh, it, and it's held by the applicant is required. Additionally, a B2 application may rely upon other listed drugs that are approved under 505 B2. They must include a patent certification or statement for each patent for the listed drug that it's relying upon. However, in these instances, reach back patent certification to the original listed drug on which, upon which the approved B2 relied upon is not required. So the difference being is, uh, is related to uh, ownership of the application. If the applicant is cross-referencing its own B2, they need to reach back to the underlying list of drugs. And if they are uh, relying upon a B2 that they do not own, they only need to certify to the relied upon B2 listed NDA, which they do not own. Another component of uh, patent certification requirements for B2s is pharmaceutical equivalence. Now, I've included here the official definition of pharmaceutical equivalence. Uh, the primary things that you need to worry about when evaluating uh, whether there's a pharmaceutical equivalent product is uh, whether or not there's something with an identical dosage form, identical route of administration, for the identical amount of the identical active ingredient. And you'll be searching through the Orange Book to identify any pharmaceutical equivalents to your proposed product. So the patent certification uh, requirements for pharmaceutical equivalent products. 
So th these requirements uh, have a couple timing caveats. Uh, primarily, it's for B2 applications that are submitted after 12-5-2016, which is the, uh, the date of the uh, final rule for the MMA, Med Medicare Modernization Act, when that went into effect. So if there's a pharmaceutical equivalent uh, product to the drug for which the original B2 application is submitted and listed in the Orange Book, and that, that pharmaceutical equivalent product is approved prior to submission of the original B2 application, the B2 applicant, applicant must also rely upon the pharmaceutical equivalent. Additional patent certification or statement may be necessary, and that's if the pharmaceutical equivalent is not already identified as the relied upon listed drug. Another thing to consider when you are providing your patent certification uh, for your B2 application is that the pharmaceutical equivalent requirements apply in the absence of other listed drug reliance. So this means that uh, potentially a literature-only B2 application may be required to provide a patent certification if there's a pharmaceutical equivalent product that was approved prior to original submission of the B2 literature-only NDA. You may not be required to provide an additional uh, bridge if the pharmaceutical reliance is only for regulatory compliance and not needed for a scientific perspective. So another thing to consider is uh, with respect to paragraph four patent certifications and method of use statements is your labeling. So is your patent certification congruent with your proposed labeling? So a couple questions you need to ask yourself is if you've provided a paragraph four patent certification, have you retained the method of uses in the, in the label that are, are related to the patents for which you're providing paragraph four patent certification? Additionally, have you carved out your me any methods of use for which you have provided a method of use statement? And then also, uh, sometimes a split patent certification may be warranted where you have to provide a paragraph four and a method of use statement for a single patent that has claims with respect to drug substance and or drug product in addition of to method of use claims so if a split patent certification is warranted, then you will be providing that certification and you need to be mindful of what, uh, what you're stating in your labeling and that that, that agrees with what uh, the certification is that you provided. With respect to amendments, for when you submit a, a, an amendment to your B2 application, the amendment must contain a verification statement in the cover letter to verify that the proposed change in the amendment is not one of the types of amendments described in 21 CFR 314-60-F1. And those types of changes are related to uh, new indications, new strengths, uh, a change in reformulation, and or a change in the physical form of the active ingredient. And this is a type of statement that we will be looking for in your cover letter for your amendment. It would, I've just provided this as an example, and it's just a simple sentence that you can just include in your uh, cover letter that uh, alerts us to the fact that that amendment does not contain one of these types of changes. If you do not provide for a verification statement in your amendment, then you must provide a uh, patent certification or recertification as applicable. So if the amendment does include one of the changes described in the 314-60-F2 regulation, the applicant must provide a patent certification and or recertification. Uh, what this means, uh, for example, would be a certification was provided in the original NDA, and then the applicant provided for an amendment for a reformulation and a new strength the applicant would be, would be required to provide a certification for the new strength 
and a recertification for the reformulation. Another uh, uh, thing that you need to think about is uh, it, we consider uh, an application uh, once a B2, always a B2. And this is rel related to uh, supplements to B2 NDAs. So even if the B2 supplement uh, uh, provided uh, by the applicant is relying upon their own information or literature, if that original NDA was a B2 NDA, then that supplement that contains the applicant's own, own information uh, is still considered a B2 supplement. And this is because the supplement continues to rely upon the underlying information in the relied upon original NDA. And as such, a new patent certification is expected for the supplement uh, if there's any listed dr drug reliance in the original NDA and or in the supplement. So um, I have a couple of challenge questions for you to consider. Challenge question number one. When submitting an amendment to a 505B2 NDA, the applicant must A, provide a patent statement in their cover letter if applicable, B, provide a patent certification or recertification if applicable, C, provide proof of notification, or D, both A and B. The correct answer is both A and B. So we would be expecting to see either a verification statement in the cover letter or a patent certification or recertification if applicable. Challenge question two. Which conclusion is false? Patent certification requirements for 505B2 applications related to pharmaceutical equivalents, A, provide FDA an option to refuse to approve a B2 application if a, if a PE certification requirement is not met. B, apply only when the PE product has unexpired patents. C, includes time and caveats. And D, apply to B2 applications that only rely upon non-product specific literature. The correct answer is, it applies only when the PE product has unexpired patents. In other words, that's the false statement. So we would expect to see a, a patent certification irrespective of whether the PE product has uh, unexpired patents or not. So in summary, a patent certification must be maintained while the B2 application is under review and should be updated to reflect orange book changes. A patent certification requirements uh, for B2 applications and ANDAs are similar, but there are distinct differences, which I have enumerated here. In consideration of the distinct regulatory requirements for each abbreviated approval pathway is the key to maintaining accurate patent certification. Here are a couple links for you for additional information should that be, re be required. And I will be happy to take questions at the question and answer, answer session following. So uh, my closing thought is basically to stay up to date with the, uh, the Orange Book is your key to maintaining your uh, patent certifications for your B2 applications. Thank you for your attention.